uh, what's this guy's name? Brian Johnson, the, the one that spent millions on his blueprint. Are you familiar with this? Very, very strict, restrictive, almost monk-like existence, though he sounds he's very happy about it. I mean, what are the practical steps? What would those steps entail in general for a patient? What would they be looking at for a potential treatment? I know there could be many. How do you balance hormones with cellular therapies? So I'm very fortunate to have a special guest today, Dr. William Seeds, founder of the Seeds Institute and Cellular Medicine, and he's written numerous books on peptides as well. So we're happy to have him here today to discuss various topics around health, wellness, and cellular medicine. Hi, Dr. Seeds. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So, uh, and thanks for having me here. Lovely place of the Four Seasons that you've had your conference here in London. This is the first conference in London that you've had? Correct. Okay. Yep. And how do you think it's going so far? Excellent. It's been uh, well received. It's our stepping stone into Europe. And we have lots of members here in Europe and actually in the London area and patients. So it was kind of a nice thing to get over here and meet some faces and, and get this, some of these ideas more prevalent here in this space. Well, as you know, we've, we talked yesterday, uh, the traditional medicine, especially in the UK, is quite restrictive. You have to follow the cookery book, the formulary from the NHS, and if you're a private doctor, they don't really want you to deviate too much. So that does bring a challenge to our doctors in, in the UK. What do you think uh, are ways to overcome this, this challenge? You know, our, our approach is understanding the mechanisms of what keeps a cell efficient, what protects a cell, and understanding that it's not just the use of peptides, it's the use of supplements, small molecules, repurposed drugs. There's all kinds of things that we can do that no matter where you are in the world and where you practice, where you can use your mind, your brain, and figure these things out. You're not band-aiding or treating symptoms. If you understand the molecular biology, the quantum physics, the biochemistry of the cell, that's so, that's the blueprint. So it's it's actually it goes really deep into understanding the basically getting down to all that you saw me spend so much yeah, time so, on cellular redox yes. yesterday. So just to kind of sum it up in in for her beginning intro for cellular medicine in in a nutshell in the shortest uh, phrase possible. What is that and how would that relate to balancing hormones? Sure. So cellular medicine is focused on keeping the best way to think about this is people aging, right? Because that's we're all familiar with it. And and we could consider aging a natural process or we could consider it a disease because aging eventually leads to all problems, diabetes, glaucoma, sarcopenia, osteopenia, neurodegenerative diseases. It all happens as we age, correct? For the most yeah. part. So cellular medicine is really just focused on understanding these mechanisms that occur over time, these pathways that change, that make a cell lose its ability to stay flexible in how we may decide what we eat, you know, glucose, fatty acids, proteins. How does that cell utilize that to stay efficient? And what actually happens over time Especially if, you know, with your audience, it's focused on, on, on hormones. Let's just talk about testosterone. Yeah. You know, testosterone, steroids are made in the mitochondria. So the first step of steroid synthesis is uh, basically cholesterol to pregnenolone. That occurs in the mitochondria. Well, if the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, is not running efficiently, you're going to have problems with making any of your hormones. You're going to have discrepancies. And that's, that's the beauty of potentially if you can get to people earlier mm. where you understand what's happening as we age, as we have decreased mitochondrial function, we have decreased NAD production, decreased alpha ketoglutarate, the master hormone, you have decrease of antioxidants, you have all these things that actually affect how the mitochondria functions. So that's an increase in senescence, you had, you had mentioned that before. So as yeah. those things happen, the cell loses its ability to control its environment, and some cells go bad, and they turn into these senescent cells that become inflammatory. So those lead to changes that affect how a good cell can like produce testosterone. So 
if you can improve function, guess what? You can actually go back and improve steroidogenesis. You can improve production of some of these hormones. You can improve a lot of things that people didn't think you were capable of doing, or you can protect that mechanism if you get to people earlier. So what if I told you I'm not a, against hormonal treatment? I'm not... I'm all about getting to that point before so I can keep people away from it. Sure. So if I get to somebody earlier where usually at about the age of 20, in the late 20s, early 30s, you start to lose your master hormone, growth hormone. It starts to de diminish because of some, because of aging and a lot of other factors that things just affect losing that capability of growth hormone. Well, growth hormone has a tremendous effect on mitochondrial efficiency and the immune system and fat oxidation, all these mm. things that are important that's, that can lead into a cascade of other problems of where the mitochondria lose its efficiency. So what's normally going to happen is testosterone production can kind of slow down. Well, what if I could control that mitochondria in keeping it more efficient, keeping it more effective in what it does. Well, what that means is I'm able to take potentially those people that problems with that type of production, I can protect them so they don't need that replacement when they're older. I can even change that with some people that are considering hormonal replacement with so, making the mitochondria more efficient. All right, for instance, in this example then, so what would the diagnostic tool be and then what would your potential intervention be i mean how would you obviously you could do a blood test to know they're getting low in testosterone but you're saying you're taking them back to that step before they would actually need replacement so maybe they just fall outside of a reference range yeah testosterone can be a number that you could use yeah. um but i will tell you i have older patients that have lower testosterone levels that i take this approach before i start them on testosterone and i change everything where they feel great and they they don't entertain that they're right. like they're like okay i don't have to be focused on this number anymore okay. and it's it's because there's so many other things you're working on it you're working on androgen receptors right. so androgen receptors can be a whole nother world here where people don't realize that receptors you may not have a lot of testosterone but if you recept if you have good receptors that may be all you need it, and that's yeah. what people and the other thing people don't you know it's very hard like I would tell everybody, if you have a twenty-year-old male, right, get your levels now. Let's That's see. What let's say, see what yeah. your testosterone is now. What your estrogen is, progesterone. Have that in the bank, so you know when you're older, you've got something to compare to. Exactly. But we don't have that, right, for most people when we see them. And so, again, it's just a number. But mitochondrial function is a whole different animal where you can, we can evaluate that. It's not a number, but it's looking at if you. So the mitochondria, when it's running efficiently, yeah. it can take fatty acids and oxidize them and make more NAD and ATP, and it's functioning well. Well, we can look at, there are studies out there that are pretty complex, but very good in looking at your reserves of long-chain fatty acids, and we can look at specific, like adrenic acid, uh, arachidonic acid, uh, palmitic acid, which are all different lengths, the adrenic's the longest, and if you can look at how they compare to each other in what you have as a reserve, you can actually tell how well the mitochondria is working because longer chain fatty acids are the first thing the mitochondria is chopping down, and then it chops it into smaller, smaller, smaller to keep reusing it to make ATP. Right. So you can absolutely tell functionally how well the mitochondria is working because all these other things where people look at a number or they say they have a mitochondrial test, that's bullshit. You got to biop cell you're looking at to really get that kind of idea. But you can look at things like fatty acids and, and get a great idea. So if you have a long, loss of long chain fatty acids, that means the mitochondria is not doing such a good job in chopping them up? Correct. You've got an issue already of mitochondrial in inefficiency also telling you that you're going to have a problem with the ratios of NAD over NADA, which is about transferring electrons and, and how the electron transport system works with the mitochondria and how efficient it is. But that's all about making ATP. So you can get an idea of how is the energy being produced in that cell. And then, and then you can look at, you get an idea also of how NADPH, which is a reducing type of 
master reducer of the body redox factor, you can get an idea of your antioxidant system based on that too. So there's there's a lot you Love can... Love that goes into it. Yeah. Just yeah. want to touch on what you said about uh, making the androgen receptor more sensitive. Now, mm -hmm. it's very easy to say, oh, well, this substance might do that much substance. I know went some studies around L-carnitine may make the androgen receptor more sensitive. And, and also, there's the CAG repeats in some other, other um, I think the ISSAM's guidance talks about, you can have long CAG repeats in, on your androgen receptor genome, which makes you um, less sensitive to testosterone, and short CAG repeats that makes you more sensitive. So are you saying you can change the CAG repeats, or are we talking about improving the uh, sensitivity of the androgen receptor with certain substances? Sensitivity, because it's all based on redox and inflammation. It's okay. all comes back to how all receptors, not just androgen receptors, but any receptors and how you get, you get actually phenotypical changes in the function of how those receptors are made because they're constantly made. And it's all about inflammation. It's all about all these things that eventually affect, you know, when people get these receptor problems, they're there are many, many issues that it's not just one thing. There's, and that's why they're called phenotypical because it's environment, it's diet, it's, right. it's all these things that lead to, again, inflammatory changes of these superoxides, peroxides, uh, DNA changes, and then it eventually the phenotype changes. changes yeah. Yeah. So if you just focus on efficiencies and bringing, which you can change, it's amazing that you can bring back cell function, you start correcting everything. So, so what are some steps you can take? Do we need to go, uh, what's this guy's name, Brian Johnson, the, the one that spent millions on his blueprint, are you familiar with this? Uh, and, and living a very, very strict, restrictive, almost monk-like existence, though he sounds like he's very happy about it. I mean, what are the practical steps? Obviously, see a cellular medicine practitioner, but what, other, what would those steps entail in general for a patient? What would they be looking at for a potential treatment, I know there could be many, but just kind of a, a ballpark. Well, well the, uh, you know, the most obvious are sleep, right? Because sleep is the key to life and recovery. Deep sleep is so important in their, you know, you know, phase. Those phases of sleep at night in the first phase four is when you get your highest growth hormone release right. at nighttime. That first phase of sleep. As you start aging and you have all these problems, people miss that. And they lose a sig nighttime is so significant, and circadian rhythms are so significant to efficiencies of a cell. So, and lymphatic drainage, all these things that are important. So, sleep, diet, of course, yeah. right? You've, I'm sure you talk about that ad nauseum. Yeah. And, and of course, training, right? Working Exercise, out. Yeah. It's becoming what's the best thing right now that I, I love is finally people are. Uh, the literature is coming full force now showing that resistance training has a lot of benefits, not just, it used to be all this aerobic and cardiac and high intensity. Well, finally, all the good stuff is coming now that we're showing all these myokine and exokine changes that are all related to what we're talking about, efficiencies yep. of the cell. So that being said, you cannot today ignore everybody's having some type of issue with the microbiome that's affecting yeah. the immune metabolism. Because what people don't realize is the immune system is very integral with metabolism. And the immune system is something that we're constantly, we need to modulate to help us in recovery and repair and restoration. If you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, you're overtraining or undertraining, you get issues with the microbiome and dysbiosis that creates this inflammatory place and uh, immune problems that you can't beat, you, you know? And Yeah, exactly. So that leads me to what about the role of endocrine disrupting hormones that seem to be everywhere? Are they, they're obviously playing a role. I mean, is that, that kind of fits in with the cellular sure. medicine? Yeah, story? absolutely. Yeah. That, that would be called a, a xenobiotic or a, it would be an environmental phenotypical type of thing that would have an influence also. And it, it's all about, again, your body's amazing, right? You can you can put up with a lot of a lot of stuff. You can you your body is made to fight and adapt. You need to help it. And if you give it a little help and you understand that, you know, in cellular medicine, our focus is on letting the cell get back its ability to do the things it's been around for millions of years and capable of adapting and changing because we're still here. 
water. So that's why we go beyond just like testosterone or estrogen. We go beyond that to where can we help make all that better? Where can we do things if we get enough intervention to even stop that from even being necessary? That's huge. Yeah. That's that's huge, right? Absolutely, and that, and that's where you you. I mean, it sounds like the testosterone is one piece of the puzzle. It's a small but the, piece, yeah. But the bigger picture, I think, it goes to this theory of the redox theory, which, which ties into the cellular medicine. And you know, I guess it's a fight between reactive oxygen species and having your own body make up enough antioxidants. But I think it goes a bit deeper. Correct. Yeah. Well, and that's yeah, that's great that you came away with that. That makes me feel good. <laughs> we the cell is meant to adapt. It has to be stressed to change, right? When, when you build muscle, to build muscle, you've got to increase weight. You're stressing it more. It has to adapt to get stronger, right? So the next time you do it, it can do it. It's no different with the environment we live in and what we deal with and stress and everything. The, the cell has to adapt. Well, those stresses are oxidative stresses the reductive agents are antioxidants we make, so they keep things in balance. That's right. So let's say your, your people out there yeah. love their antioxidants yeah. and they love to work out. Well, they got to be careful because you need those stressors on the cell to make the cell adapt to get better at your training. If you're using all these antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, yeah. you're doing all these things, what are you doing? You're over-reducing, you're taking away those stressors that the body needs to adapt to. Unless you get into like when we deal with our high level, you know, our intense athletes that we're working on a hundredth of a second to improve that'll make a difference in their in a gold medal versus not a gold medal. Well, that's different because at higher levels of training, yeah, then you gotta control these things a little bit because they're their system is really active and, and they're making a lot of these stressors that you got to calm them down a little bit because it's, you know, it's like an engine, right? Yeah. This engine, you got, it's, you got to keep it cool. It's got to have a coolant system. It can't get too revved up. It gets too revved up. You're getting out of control. So that, that's kind of the concept of the cell. Interesting. Well, that's, I really appreciate you coming on. Where can people find you or join? Do you have to be a doctor to join the Institute or uh, can other knowledgeable uh, people uh, follow it or learn more about uh, cellular medicine? Yeah, uh, so the society is, we're, it's interesting you ask that now because we've got a lot of smart people that have been very interested and in that's why you have these bigger world meetings where we let people come yep. and they learn. But we do, we do have an area of where people can get involved if they want to learn more, and that's building more and okay. more. Yeah. Again, more people to be part of this. So we're really good. Good work that you're doing. We really appreciate you coming on. And uh, for everyone watching, if you like this video, leave your comments for Dr. William Seed, and we'll try to answer them. And again, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, good. Appreciate it.